And what, do you know the meaning of fluids? That's exactly what I heard, but I heard gases here. So fluids is anything that can flow. It includes both liquids and gases. And we will divide this chapter into two parts. In the first part, we look at fluids not flowing, fluids at rest. It's called fluid statics. In the second part of the chapter, we look at fluid dynamics. So today we'll only do fluids, but not flowing. It's like water in a container, just kept there. So it'll be the little simple definitions. We begin with density that you're so much used in chemistry. Density is the mass of unit volume. It should be, remember, it should be more than knowing the equation. Density is equal to mass divided by volume. That's good enough. That's a good equation, but you have to know when you talk about the density, you are giving the mass of either one centimeter cube or one meter cube. And in chemistry, most of the time you use centimeter cube or milliliters. We cannot do that here. Because the proper unit of length is meter, therefore the unit of volume becomes meter cube. And the standard for density is water. What's the density of water? I knew you would say one. That's what you use in chemistry, but that's one gram per centimeter cube. Both units not acceptable in physics. One gram per centimeter cube translates to 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. So right, from now, right now, the density of water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. The symbol for density is rho. That's the symbol. So density is mass by volume, and its unit is kilogram per meter cube. And just now I told you that the density of water is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. That's the standard. So you compare the density of everything with that of water. So I wrote it as one gram per centimeter cube, so you would make that connection. But we'll always use 1,000. Now, since you uh, compare everything with water, we have to define a new term called relative density. Now, what is relative density? It's the density of the substance divided by the density of water. That's all. So if you're looking for the relative density of something, just take the density of that thing divided by the density of water. So I said density of x. It could be anything. And of course, it has no unit because it's a ratio. You know that mercury is really heavy, isn't it? Mercury is heavy. Uh, just as an example, the relative density of mercury is 13.6. Now, what does that mean? That means mercury is 13.6 times heavier than an equal volume of water. Now, relative density is also called specific gravity. So you have to be aware of that. Relative density is also called specific gravity. Remember, it has nothing to do with gravity. So these two words, either relative density or specific gravity. Don't try to make a question, because these things are easy. What happened? There's a T down there. OK. Pressure. The definition of pressure is it is force divided by area. Sometimes you would find a word called thrust. Have you ever seen that? Thrust. The word thrust means a perpendicular force. <coughs> so the actual definition is pressure is thrust divided by area. So if a, if a person is standing, you know that the weight of the entire person is acting on the area of the soles of his shoes, isn't it? So you should be able to easily calculate the pressure exerted. Just take the weight of the person, which is the force, divided by the, the area of both the soles, right? You would get the pressure. Do you think it will be small or large? Remember that the area is small. 
therefore the pressure will be large. And just add on to that, this thought, you know, ladies wearing stiletto type shoes, and if they happen to step on you, if you are barefoot, oh, you will cry. Because now you see that the stiletto type shoe has a real small area, right? At the so even if the person is slim and lean and good looking, still that small weight acting over a little area makes it huge. You will shout. And I also add the thought of a knife and why it cuts. When you say something is sharp, you're trying to say that the area is really small. And when the area is small, for a definite force, the pressure becomes really high. You see that? That's why it cuts. So apply that to everything. This is a very important topic. Pressure is a very important topic. Yeah, even apply to human beings. When you start talking about blood pressure, you know how important that is. We are going to connect that. And so it's, it, everything in physics is important in every field, actually. So you can see that pressure is forced by area. Simple. What's the unit of pressure? Just put the units of force and area together. Force is newtons and area is meter squared. So newton per meter squared is also called Pascal. I told you that when we talked about Young's modulus. You remember that? Yeah. The unit is newton per meter squared. And I just wanted to tell you that smaller the area, bigger the pressure. That's what I've been trying to say. A small area. It's a bigger pressure. The tip of a nail, I said the tip of a nail. The area is so small, knife. Again, the area is small. So I just try to give you some examples, and you can think of that. You can add to that the stiletto type shoes of a beautiful lady. Well, I don't want to start telling stories yet. Okay. <laughs> so many times, going on into the third section, um, Oh, the talk is about atmospheric pressure and the weight of the atmosphere and all that. Do you have any idea about how much the atmospheric pressure is? Many times we don't even feel it. If you don't feel it, we say it doesn't exist. That's how we are. So atmospheric pressure, is it big or small? At least tell me that. It's huge. It's so huge, I'm going to show you by means of examples. I just... But I remember this experiment I saw so many years back, 20 years maybe, 25 years back on television, I saw this. There was a dry stick, half on the table, half outside, a dry stick. And somebody, the quiz master that day, spread out a newspaper on the part of the table where the stick is, right? Half of the stick is. And he just flattened it out as if to remove all the air from underneath it. And of course, he cannot remove all the air, but as best as he could. And he asked the teams, like there were three or four teams, and he asked them, what will happen if I hit the side of the stick, you know, the stick that is protruding? He asked them, what will happen? And none of them said that the stick would break. All of them said the newspaper will fly away, which is what might be passing through your minds. But if I just rechange the question, or reword, rather, the question and say, what if I had a heavy object on this side of the stick? I remove the newspaper, and I have a big stone, a huge stone kept here. And then I ask you the same question. If I hit here, what will happen? You will say it will break. It's a dry stick. OK? Now, you have to understand that the, the pressure of the atmosphere is much greater than the biggest stone that you can ever find. I hope you understood. So what's the atmospheric pressure? How much is it? This is the thought that passed through the mind of an Italian scientist called Torricelli. And in one of the streets in Italy, I, I can't remember which one, he did this lab. He did this experiment right in the middle of the street. Because people would not accept, you know, unless they see it. He took a tube. This tube could have been like 12 meters long, open at one end closed at the other. Are you seeing it? Visualize. And he filled it with water. OK, so this is the open end. This is closed. He filled it with water, 12 meters long. And then he inverted it into a trough of water there, like that. 
While inverting it, of course, he had closed the open end with something, and then the trough contains some water, and he put this into this, and he took away whatever was holding the water there, okay, just removed it. Amazing. What do you think will happen? Do you think all the water in the tube will flow out? No. That's what all those people in that town thought, but what came down, of course, a little bit it came down, let's say till here, and he measured the height of this water from the surface in the trough to the top was 10.33 meters and it would not come down. No matter how many times he tried it, there would always be 10.33 meters of water column staying there. And he explained to the public that it's the atmospheric pressure that's holding it there because this is an open container, so the atmosphere is pressing down on this, isn't it? And liquids transmit pressure equally in all directions. You heard me. That's actually called Pascal's law. That's where we get that unit, Pascal. Liquids transmit pressure equally in all directions. Therefore, the water transmits the pressure. You know what I'm trying to say. And therefore, the atmosphere is holding that liquid column up. So to calculate the atmospheric <laughs> pressure, all you have to do is this. Find out the pressure exerted by 10.33 meters of water. Did that make any sense? Because their pressures must be equal, isn't it? The water column is weighing down. The atmosphere is holding it up. There is equilibrium there. That means the atmospheric pressure must be equal to the pressure exerted by 10.33 meters of water. How do you calculate that? By using the formula <coughs> H rho G. That's the formula for pressure exerted by a fluid. And I'm going to derive it in two minutes. But it's a very important formula. And this is called the gauge pressure. The gauge pressure. The pressure exerted by a fluid is given by height times rho times G. All right, let's get that. So you have a container filled with a liquid, and we have to move through this fast because otherwise it becomes dead boring, such an easy topic. The height of the liquid is H, or the height of the fluid <laughs> is H. The area of the base of the container is A. Can you tell me how much volume there is? What's the volume of the liquid? H -A. A H or H A. Can you tell me the mass of the liquid? How do you get the mass from the volume? Multiply by the density. Mass is density times volume, isn't it? OK. Therefore, the volume of the liquid is A times H. The mass of the liquid in the container is A times H times rho. How do you get the weight of the liquid? From the mass, how do you get the weight? G. Multiply with G. So the weight of the liquid is A H rho G. And isn't that the force? Isn't weight a force acting perpendicular to the surface? Yeah, so to find the pressure, all you got to do is divide that by the area. Now that's the force. Therefore, the pressure is force divided by area, and you see that the area will cancel out and you will get H rho G. That's how you get that formula. And then I just want to check whether you understand this. So let's say you have three types of containers, or maybe two. I got tired. All right, they, they are filled with the same liquid filled with the same liquid to the same height. I call one A, the other is called B. All right, you heard me, same liquid to the same height. At the bottom of which container would the pressure be greater, at A or B? And take a few seconds to think. At the bottom of which container would the pressure be greater? And always remember that I'm a crook. 
Thank you for saying it will be the same. Because just one minute back I told you pressure depends only on the height, the density, and the acceleration due to gravity. Didn't I tell you that? Is the height the same for both? Come on now. Is it the same liquid? <coughs> so you do not go by what it appears to be. What will happen in our minds is, ooh, there is more liquid here. Who cares? The pressure exerted by a liquid depends only on the height and its density. Keep that in your mind. So if I had another container, and because I got tired, you know, if I had another container like this, but with the same liquid to the same height. Would you agree that the pressure would be the same? Yes. Or what if I had a container like that? Filled with the same liquid to the same height. When I say height, it's the vertical height. Will the pressure be the same? Yes. Yes, therefore the pressure exerted by a liquid does not depend on the size of the container, does not depend on the shape of the container. It only depends on the height of the liquid and its density. Therefore, can you now calculate the atmospheric pressure? Because I gave you the height of water that Torricelli had there. How much? Okay, put those numbers and give me the atmospheric pressure quickly. Not that I don't remember, but you have to do something. 10.33 times uh, the density of water is 1,000 times 9.8, and I want you to see that big number that comes up. Huh? Okay, if you had taken the exact numbers, we would have got 101325. You should have got close to that. Approximately 100,000 pascals. Wow! Do you know that that is the weight of 10,000 kilograms, approximately? <clears throat> well, let me say that again. Do you know that 100,000 newtons, doesn't this mean 100,000 newtons per meter squared? Come on. Every meter squared, the atmospheric pressure is 100,000 newtons, which means it's like 10,000 kilograms kept there. Now tell me, is it small or large? It's huge. Why don't we feel it? Because inside our bodies, there is an extra pressure internal that's trying to balance it. But if you go deep sea diving, and you have no protection on, when you come back, you'll be dead. If you can survive at the bottom, when you come back, you'll be dead. Okay. As you go down, what happens to the pressure due to the liquid? Increases. But don't you think the atmospheric pressure is also there as you keep going down? Didn't I tell you that liquids transmit pressure? Come on. So you are 1,000 meters under the ocean. Can you calculate the pressure at that point? Go ahead. 1,000 meter under the ocean, calculate the actual pressure. I want the gauge pressure. Look, I want, look, there are two things. What do you mean by gauge pressure? It's only H rho G. You see that? H rho G. So calculate that first. Oh, that's easy. 1,000 times. Huh? What's that? What is that? 1,000. I thought that the ocean water had salt in it. <coughs> That's what I thought, but people just want to take the density of fresh water. Now, be awake, please. I'm trying everything to check whether you're listening. I'm talking about the ocean, and you say the density is 1,000. I feel so sad. Shouldn't it be a little greater? It's about 1,025. Except if it's the Dead Sea. The density if it is the Dead Sea, then the density is much higher. You know that you can float in the Dead Sea and read the newspaper. Yes, Alma? The density is 1,025? For seawater. For ocean water. For fresh water, it's 1,000, okay? So multiply that, what did you get? The 1,000 meters, that's how. Low. Is the height, is the depth? Oh, that's tough to calculate. Come on. 1,000 times 1,025 times 9.8. Huh? 10 million 45,000. Hold it right there. Let me try. Did I get it? Zero. Uh, one more. 
They get it? <laughs> okay. That is not small. <clears throat> now, what is that? That's not the total pressure. That's only the pressure due to the ocean. <laughs> ocean. So that's called the gauge pressure. Now, can you calculate the total pressure? You will have to add the approximately 100,000 to this, which will make it, you know what I mean. Now, that is called the absolute pressure. So let me write this formula down. Absolute pressure is always atmospheric pressure plus H rho G. Very important. Absolute pressure means total pressure. All right? And absolute pressure is atmospheric pressure plus H rho G. There's confusion here because this A doesn't stand for absolute. It stands for atmospheric. So I don't know. You've got to remember it or just write it. Absolute pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure plus H rho G. So that is the idea of atmospheric pressure that I was talking about. Let's, let's go back and see what we did. But this Torricelli, for the first time, he created, wait, what do we have here? What do we have here? Vacuum. 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 For the first time, he created what's called vacuum, without any pump, nothing. Well, it was not a total vacuum, it was partial vacuum. Therefore, it's actually called Torricellian vacuum. Yeah, the first time anybody does anything, it's noticed. First time in history he creates vacuum, and you know what, why that happened. But this length was too big, 10.33. So then I tell you he had about 12 meter long tube there. Next time he did this with mercury. And mercury is 13.6 times heavier than water. So what do you expect to happen to the height? How much? If it's 10.33 for water, for mercury it would be that divided by Try to do that. 10.33 divided by 13, 13.6. Uh, do that. 0.75. Uh, 76. That's why in chemistry you keep saying that the atmospheric pressure is equal to 760 millimeter of mercury. Or 76 centimeters of mercury. That's what you mean. You mean to say that the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure exerted by 76 centimeters of mercury. Is that clear enough now? Okay, 760 millimeter, 76 centimeter, 0. 0.76 meter. Oh, goodness, I just gave it in three units just to show off. Okay, so that's the atmospheric pressure. Didn't we talk about this? I was a little slow in bringing this up. That is the tube filled with mercury. That is 76 centimeters of Hg. Okay, atmospheric pressure is pushing down, holding that column up. That's so easy to understand. Nothing there, and, and that is given by H rho G, so when you put it in meters, it's 0 0.76 times the density of mercury. 13,600 times 9.8 gives you approximately 101.325 Newton per meter squared, which is a number you have to remember which is very approximately 100,000. You see that? And uh, this time the symbols, sorry, I put it as, I didn't remember that. But anyway, just know that absolute pressure is the sum of the atmospheric pressure and the pressure due to the liquid. That's all you have to remember, whatever symbols you use, okay? Absolute pressure, that is atmospheric pressure plus gauge pressure. But why is this called the gauge pressure? Uh, you try to measure the air pressure in the tires using the gauge. What pressure are you going to get? Think. Are you going to get the total pressure? But please think. Or are you going to get what's over and above the atmospheric pressure? I mean, what are you going to get? The question is very clear, right? When you use that gauge, the pressure that it reads, is that the total pressure inside the tires, or is it... Is that the absolute pressure? Now, aren't we measuring it using a gauge? Aren't we measuring it using a gauge? So technically, it's the gauge pressure, which means it's only the pressure due to the... That's why it's called the gauge pressure, you know? Gauge pressure is the pressure that any gauge shows you, which will not be the total pressure, okay? Yes? 
But isn't the atmosphere of pressure acting on the tire? Isn't it acting inside and outside? <laughs> Canceling itself out? It's amazing, you know, you, I know, because here you go to service stations to top up the engine oil, but if you ever try to top it up yourself, and you try to pour the oil from a can, if you make one hole in the can and try to pour it out, it'll never come out. Try it. If you make, you know, you have a, a can of motor oil, and you make a hole on the top and turn it, and you think it's going to come down, it's never going to come down. Well, you might be able to, you know, get drops out by <clears throat> shaking it. It won't come up. Why? Why? What's holding it? What's fighting against it? You have the can with a small hole in it. The pressure of the liquid inside is small as compared to the atmospheric pressure trying to keep it from coming out. You won't manage. But the moment you make another hole, you mo the moment you make another hole, be careful because now all of it is going to come down. That make any sense? I, I saw this elementary kids are coming again this Friday and in chemistry lab, they try to steal away from physics. It's actually a physics experiment that they were doing at one station, but there's no fight, I'm just joking. This is what they did. They took a tin, closed it tightly, and heated it. Uh, kept it open and heated it. The tin was open and then held it over a flame. What happens to the air inside? When you heat it, what happens? It expands, and most of it will go out, isn't it? Yeah. And while it is still hot, what they did is they closed it. They just capped it tightly. And then held it under cold water, coming out of a tap. Guess what happens? It crushes, it crushes the can, and now you know why. Because when you cool it, the pressure goes down. Isn't it inside? The pressure goes down, and the atmospheric pressure is pushing it from all sides. Or oh, it's a sight that you have to watch. It just gets crushed from all sides. Or, you know, you should try this at home. Take a glass full of water. Fill it completely with water. Close it with a cardboard. Okay? And slowly. But please do it over the sink. Okay. <laughs> the glass has to be completely filled with water. Make sure there's no air inside. Close it with a cardboard and invert it the water will stay there for sure. Because according to what we study, it should hold the water as long as it's 10.33 meters long. Is anybody with me? And this is a really small glass, isn't it? So the pressure from inside is nothing compared to the atmospheric pressure that is holding it there. But the problem is, if air seeps in even a little bit, all the water comes out. Haven't we been using vacuum suction devices, like cloth hangers? You don't know what I'm talking about? Little plastic pieces to stick the GPS on the windshield of the car? Come on now, what's the idea there? Nothing except that when you press it down, the air from inside goes away, and that's all you need to do. If you remove the air from inside, and as long as no air gets back in, the atmospheric pressure will keep it there. Nobody's going to remove it. I wish you, I hope you understood. Not wish, I'm sure everybody understood. If you remove the air, that, you're gone. That could be applied to the current of the shower, right? I told you about Pascal's principle. Then I told you liquids transmit pressure equally in all directions. That is Pascal's principle. Equal transmission of pressure in all directions. Well, surely everybody knows that the brake system in a car uses a fluid. Don't you know that? And if that fluid leaks away, you leak away. <laughs> and that's one of the most important systems in the car, right? The fluid usually never, never leaks away. And, but you'll have to take care of it, you know, top it up if required, and all that. But I'm going to see, tell you how this is applied. But... You know, there are many types of jacks. There is a mechanical jack. Have you ever seen a mechanical jack, you know, where you just turn it around and it'll go, oh, that's so tough. But compare it with the hydraulic jacks in a service station where you just, oh, the whole car goes up. Don't you want to know why and how? It's Pascal's principle. 
Very simple principle, good, put to good use. Okay, so you have two cylinders, one on the left side that is smaller, the other on the right side which is bigger. It's filled with a liquid, of course. It's filled with a liquid. I'm going to have to ask you a question. Small a is the area of cross-section of that piston, okay? And the area of cross-section of the bigger one is cap a. Oh, that's the liquid. Just got filled now. Okay. My question is this. If I apply a pressure here, like push down on this, will the same pressure act on this upwards? If I apply a pressure, the pressure, the pressure, but the force would be will the pressure be the same? Yes. What is Pascal's law? A liquid transmits pressure equally in all directions. So the pressure will be the same, right? Okay. Therefore, let's say the force that I apply on this side is the little f. What's the pressure there? If f is the force and a is the area, what's the pressure? F divided by a. And let's say that the pressure acting here, I mean the force acting here is caps F. So can't I say that F by A is equal to F by A? Because the pressures are equal. And therefore if I rearrange, don't I get this? Oh, that was too fast. Okay, don't I get this? Oh, tell me about this ratio. Is this greater than one? So if this ratio is 100, this simply means that we have magnified the force 100 times. But you can't get everything in life. If you got to get some things, you got to lose some, right? Perfect example. It looks like you magnified the force here 100 times. Can anybody tell me what you lose? And you got to think about it. What do you lose? I mean, you got the force. Multiplied 100 times or 50 times. You have to certainly lose something. That just ties in with, you know, if you have a 4.0 GPA here, you are missing something in life. Missing, according to some other people. Missing on the fun. But wait. You can't have it all. So what are you losing here? Come on. Water. The liquid doesn't leak out, Munir. <laughs> no, you're not. Energy. How are you? Energy? I thought uh, energy is always conserved. You touch something on which if you think you'll get the answer. I thought energy can neither be created nor destroyed, right? It is transferred. Now, what do you lose here? You know, this is where I like to take even five minutes, you know. And so what do you lose here? I can wait for one more minute. If you really... Now, some did not even... Did not understand that. I think what he meant to say is that if you push this down one meter, this piston will only move by one by hundredth of a meter. Because remember, work is force multiplied by distance, isn't it? And so the work must be the same. Energy must be the same. Therefore, if you got this caps F to be 100 times greater, surely the distance that is moved should be 100 times less. Come on now. But that's okay. At least we can lift it. Who cares if you have to, you know, exert that force a little bit more? See, that's the idea of the hydraulic jack. Or the brake system, same thing. Have you ever wondered what the kinetic energy of that car is when it's moving on the freeway at 75 miles per hour with uh, four people inside and uh, including the mass of the car? You know the kinetic energy is one half times the mass times the square of the velocity. Now that's huge. And have you want, ever wondered how easily we are able to stop it just by applying? Stopped. It's because of Pascal's principle. Well, in that case, you know, there is a master cylinder which connects to all the four tires. You know that, right? And the braking system should be perfect in that the forces acting on all four must be equal and at the same time. Did you hear me? Otherwise, the area car will go to one side 
And you will know that. So all this is taken care of, and this is physics, this is engineering at its best. And there is no going back on that. All right? Any questions on that? All kinds of wood are not the same, right? Let's get another piece of wood that um, goes down uh, just one foot. So it's like a major part of it is outside, one foot. Imagine. I really don't think there's wood like that, but just imagine. <laughs> imagine. Only one fourth underwater, three fourths above water. Can you please tell me the density of that wood? 250. Now, without any calculation, now you know that the greater the density of the object, the more it should be submerged. And let me ask you this. If I could get a material that could float exactly like that, com just completely submerged, you would all agree that its density is 1,000 kilogram per meter cube. Would you? Come on. It's just completely submerged. It's so much so that if I blow, it will go down. So it's just like completely balanced. And now something happens. Suddenly, as you're watching, some air bubbles come and get stuck on this. You know, sometimes how air bubbles are produced on water. And then, what do you think will happen? Will it go up or down? Up. Up. This is Archimedes' principle. We're talking about Archimedes' principle. And have you, haven't you seen hot air balloons just going up? Yeah. Or helium balloons, for that matter? So we should be able to calculate what the maximum mass that balloon can carry. You should be able to. So what's the formula now? What is the formula? Let's, let's find it. I just want it to be a suspense, you know? OK, let's see. Archimedes' principle. All right, that's the last part. And I'm trying to technically get the formula. All right, so you see a solid submerged. I need not be shouting so much, because even my shouting is not keeping some people awake. So I might be more irritating, slower. Yeah. So if you have a solid there, uh, what do you think? Will the pressure on the top face be equal to the pressure on the bottom face? What a silly question. Because the greater the depth, the greater the height, or the greater the depth, the greater the pressure. So where do you think, because I've not shown you the complete diagram, uh, where do you think more pressure will act, on the top face or the bottom? OK. What about the sides? Will there be pressure on the sides, pushing that way? Wouldn't they cancel out? So now, didn't you already understand, since the pressure at the bottom acting upwards is greater than the pressure on the top acting downwards, there is going to be a resultant force acting upwards. That is called the buoyant force. Have you ever heard of that? Or it's called the upthrust. See, thrust means force. Upthrust means this happens to any solid in a liquid. We're going to calculate the formula. Let's get that. The height there is H1. The height here is H2. The area of the face is, I don't know. I just call this AB. Let's take the area of the top face as A. Who can tell me what's the net force acting up? Let's go step by step. What's the pressure on the top face? Huh? H1 rho G. What's the pressure on the bottom face? H2 rho G. H1 is the height, the depth of the face. OK, from pressure, how do you get force? From pressure, how do you get force? By multiplying with the? So I've taken the area as little a, so you're not confused with this, OK? Area of the face is, all right, so the force on the top face is that. What is the force at the bottom face? Somebody help me, please. Force on the, at B. Somebody. No, it'll be AH2 rho G. The difference in the forces, the net force, isn't it? The net force would be, would it be, wouldn't it be up? The net force would be up, and that would be the difference between these two quantities. Okay, so I take out the common A rho G, H2 minus H1. Now somebody tell me, what's H2 minus H1? 
the height of the block. Yes, that's the height of the block. And so if you multiply the height of the block with its area, what do you get? You get the volume of what? what? The volume of the, the block. Now this is where you really have to be listening. A multiplied by H2 minus H1 gives you the volume of the block, right? Let me ask you this. In this case, will that be the same as the volume of liquid displaced? You know, when you put that block inside, wouldn't the level of the liquid go up? Come on. So am I right in saying that in this particular case, the volume of the solid will be equal to the volume of the liquid displaced? Yes or no? Yes. Keep that in mind. So A times H2 minus H1 is in this case the volume of the block and the volume of the liquid displaced, right? Okay, hold on to that thought. So AH rho G, that is H is H2 minus H1, that's the height of the block. Hmm, I'm writing everything. Or the height of the solid. Can you notice something that A times H is the volume? Didn't we say that? And what is volume times density? What's volume times density? Volume mass. mass. What's mass times G? Oh, so the net force acting up is equal to the weight of the liquid displaced. Hmm. The net force acting up is equal to the weight of the liquid displaced. That is Archimedes' principle. So according to Archimedes' principle, if you have a solid immersed in a liquid, the net buoyant force acting up will be equal to the weight of fluid displaced. That's the only formula I can give you. I cannot give you symbols. You know, you always have to remember that. It's equal to the weight of the fluid displaced. And we should be able to do problems. Ships are made of steel. I hope so. How are they able to float? The density of steel is 7,700 no, 8, kilogram per meter cube. Density of steel. The density of water is 1,025 in the ocean. Remember that. The density of steel is so many times greater, at least eight times, yet it's able to float. And you know the reason why. Because if it's floating, if it's floating, then the weight of the object is exactly equal to the buoyant force. Are you with me on that? If something is floating, isn't it staying there because the net force up is equal to its weight. Come on. That is called the law of flotation. Not the law, law of flirtation, that's different. <laughs> the, law, the law of flotation. What did I say just now? If an object floats, the weight of the floating object is equal to the weight of liquid displaced. Write that. I don't know whether I've written it. Oh, I have. I've been so good. Okay. Law of flotation. Is that the same thing as Archimedes' principle? No, we're going up beyond the Archimedes' principle now. Yeah, we're talking about floating objects. Archimedes' principle applies to anything that's in a liquid, whether it's floating or not. It may be at the bottom of the liquid. But this one, the weight of the floating object is equal to the weight of fluid displaced. So, so it would apply if it's floating then? If it's floating, yes. And uh, I have a nice neat diagram there. The weight is mg. The buoyant force is fb. They should be equal and opposite. But there is a problem. I just didn't plan to do that. But since I remember it, let me ask you this. <laughs> what if, what's the point through which the weight of an object acts? What's that point called? Center of mass. Center of mass. Okay. Yeah. So the weight acts this way. And what if the Buoyant force was acting this point. Is that good enough? And think about a ship in the ocean. Well, what will happen to that object now? What will happen to the ship now? It will rotate. Because there is a particular distance between the two, isn't it? Is it going to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise, according to my diagram? Counterclockwise. And there's no going back. You don't want that to happen. Therefore, you want the center of the buoyant force to be exactly 
above the center of mass. That's how I drew it. Did you see that? Because you do not want it to rotate. If they are at different points, it'll rotate. So when they construct a ship, it's not that easy. It's not just a dream, hey, here, let's make it, no. They have to think about all kinds of things. In fact, there's something called Meta Center. Read a little bit about this, you'll understand. So that brings us to the end of this topic. And hopefully you understand this. And I like to always say, good